For another space. So thus far we've talked about vector spaces. We've defined that. We've talked about the idea of a subspace. And now you see we've turned it into um, talking about what's happening with our systems of equations AX equals B. So we talked about a basis. And then we just talked about the column space, which is a linear combination of the columns. And now we're going to talk about the null space. And so the null space of a matrix A is the subspace containing all the vectors. And the way you read this notation, if you remember, is all the vectors x such that A times x equals 0. So this simply means that if you have a matrix A, any vector that you multiply A times and it gives you the zero vector is in the null space of A. So again, any vector that when you multiply it by A gives you the zero vector, it's in the null space of A. That's all it means. <clears throat> so here will be a clicker question. The null space of a linear transformation A is A, X such that AX equals B, B, X such that a times x equals 0, or C, x such that A times x has a solution. So I think if you look at the previous slide, you can find the answer to that clicker question. <clears throat> so here's a typical question. Find a basis for the column space of A and the null space of A. So you have a system of equations, and you've been asked to find a basis for the column space. That is, find linearly independent columns of the matrix A that actually span everything that all the columns span. That would be a basis of the column space. And then do the same thing for the null space. So let's walk through this. So if we go through the process of row reducing this matrix, we get these three steps. And you can check and make sure I haven't made any errors. And so at the top, you see that on the right, the A tilde is just the um, row reduced um, form of the matrix and then on the left A is the actual matrix. So if I look at the row reduction I know that where the leading ones are in the first two columns we know that the first two columns of A form a basis for the column space. Now why is this? Well <clears throat> it's because all of the other columns are just linear combinations of the ones that have leading ones. So you can think that through. If you're combining the col columns the only um, columns that will have leading ones will be the ones that are not linear combinations of the others. All the others could be um, eradicated, right, because you combine them together to get rid of the other columns. So this tells me that the first column and the second column of my original matrix form a basis. So the columns, the column space of A has a basis of 4, 1 and 5, 1, the first two columns of A. So now if we put that into reduced row echelon form, same matrix, you notice that the first two columns have been turned into the identity. Because the real question that we're asking is, what are the solutions to the homogeneous system of equations, right? If we find a solution to the homogeneous system of equations, then we just want to find a basis for that solution. So what we find is that to find a basis for the null space, we first put the matrix A into its reduced row echelon form. And then we see that we have some free variables, right? So x3, x4, and x5 are free because we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 columns. <coughs> you should note that when you're solving for the homogeneous system of equations, you don't need to augment with zeros because they don't change as you do the elementary row operations. So if I've done the algebra correctly, I've set some... Um, values to x3, x4, and x5. And I've started to solve. So I've got x, x2 is equal to 2s minus 2t. And x1 is equal to minus 2s plus t. And x3 is s. And x4 is t. And x5 is v. So you could verify, but all I'm doing there is solving the homogeneous system of equations just like you did back in chapter 1. And so if I break that up, so the first thing I do is I write x in all its component parts. Remember that we've just solved, if I've done everything correctly, x1 is minus 2s plus t, x2 is 2s minus 2t, x3 was chosen arbitrarily to be s, x4 arbitrarily to be t, and x5 arbitrarily to be v. And so separating those into 
s times some vector, t times some vector, and v times some vector gets what you see on the right-hand side. And so those three vectors you see form a basis for every solution to the um, homogeneous system of equations and therefore forms a basis for the null space. All right, so here's a theorem. If t is a linear transformation, we know that t maps v to w, then t of alpha u plus beta v is alpha t of u plus beta t of v, where u and v are in the vector space v, and t of u and t of v are in the vector space w, and alpha and beta are real number scalars. And so this is just a restatement of the definition of linear transformation that you learned in chapter 1. It's just that you could put it all in that one statement there because you know that it has to be the fact that you do the transformation of u plus v, that's the transformation of u and v, and then the transformation of alpha u is alpha times the transformation of u. So we can put them all together into one statement. <coughs> and so the kernel of a linear transformation, t that maps v into w, is denoted by the KER of t and is all the vectors v such that t of v is equal to the zero vector. So what you might see immediately is that there is a real connection between this definition of a kernel and the definition of the null space. The definition of the null space, if you recall, is just all of the x's such that a times x equals zero. So it's all the x vectors that when you multiply those by a, you get the zero vector. Look at the kernel of t. It's all the vectors v such that when you transform v, you get the zero vector. So it's exactly the same definition. It's just one is for the very specific case in which the linear transformation is a n by m matrix. And the other is very general. It's a general definition of any linear transformation. So a clicker question, of course, the kernel of a linear transformation t that maps v to w is all vectors t of u equal to w, all vectors u such that t of u equals zero, the same as a nullity of a matrix A representing t, A, B, and C, or B and C. So I think if you think about that and look at the three or four slides previous to this, you can find that answer for yourselves. So here's a picture. The kernel of t are all the vectors in the vector space v that get mapped to the zero vector in w. And so you see the diagram there. So the range of a linear transformation, you should know this, are all the vectors t of u that equal w, all the vectors u such t of u equals zero, the same as a nullity of a matrix A representing t, a, b, and c, or b, and c. So we know about a range because we learned that back in chapter one. Uh, remember when we talked about linear transformations there, we talked about um, the domain, the image, the range. We have all of those things there. So if you just look back at those notes, you should be able to answer this question as well. So definition of range, T mapping V to W denote by range of, and that's a typo there, forgive me, that should be range of T, is range of T is equal to W such that T of V equals W. And v is in the vector space V, and the vector W is in the vector space W. So here's a graphic for the range. Notice that you map everything in the vector space V. It goes into some subspace of W, and wherever that is, that is the range of T. So this is a very important theorem, and what this theorem says is that if you have a linear transformation, that maps R n to R m, then that can be written as a matrix. So every linear transformation that maps R n to R m can be written as a matrix. And that matrix A has as its jth column the transformation of E sub j, and therefore T of x is equal to A of x. And if you just remember, E sub j is the jth column of the n by n or m by m identity matrix. So proof. We know that x is equal to c1, e1, all the way to cn, en, if it's written in terms of the standard basis, we call it, or in terms of the columns of the identity matrix in Rn, right? Because x is a vector in Rn, and it's getting mapped into a vector 
in RM. <clears throat> so every X is a linear combination of the columns of the identity matrix. Think of a vector in R2, say the vector 2, 3. Clearly 2, 3 is the same thing as 2 times E1 plus 3 times E2. So now we're ready to apply the linear transformation to both sides of the equation. And this yields t of x is equal to t of c1, e1, all the way to cn, en. Because it's a linear transformation, the scalars can come out and the transformation distributes. So you get that's equal to c1, t of e1, all the way to cn, t of en. Notice that that's just the vector equation, right? So we learned back in chapter one, probably in the first or second section, that any vector equation is just a matrix equation. So therefore, the right-hand side of the equation is the same as AX, and we know now that AX equals T of X, where the jth column of A is precisely T of EJ. Because if you look up there in the rectangular box, the first column of my matrix A would be T of E1. The second column would be T of E2, all the way to the nth column would be T of E sub N. So we've proven the theorem. All right, there are a few examples here, and I'm going to let you just go through those and look at them. I'm sure that you'll be fine with those. I'm skipping right through these. I'll let you take a look at them. And so here's a summary of subspace, column space, and null space. They're all in one spot for you, and I hope you find this to be helpful.